falling ammunition stockpiles, weakening morale and donor fatigue among its allies. Those are just some of the challenges facing Ukraine as it approaches the second anniversary of Russia's full-scale attack. Can Ukraine survive another year? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. The recent loss of a frontline town to Russian forces has underscored the difficulty Ukraine faces. After two years of bitter fighting and a multi-billion dollar aid package stalled in the US Congress, just how are Ukrainians coping? TRT World correspondent Joel Flynn travelled to the Ukraine and sent us this report. Well, we're currently in the town of Murnograd, which is uh, less than 40 kilometers from uh, Ukraine's eastern front line with Russia, 40 kilometers or so too from the town of Advivka, which Ukrainian forces have had to retreat from in uh, what has been a key strategic victory for Russian forces. It demonstrates that this war has now entered a critical new stage. And uh, as we approach the second anniversary of that war, uh, very clearly Ukraine is struggling, uh, struggling to hold positions like those in Advivka, struggling too, because it is lacking in Western ammunition, uh, Western supplies to uh, continue to help it uh, defend some of these uh, positions uh, right along this front line through to the south in places like uh, Robotna below uh, Zaporizhia uh, and across the Dnipro River. Uh, this is what uh, the front line is uh, dealing with. Issues around things like bullets as well as uh, questions around more expensive things like uh, anti-air defences and long-range missiles. Russia is still able to produce those in large quantities and deploy those uh, with brutal effectiveness against uh, these Ukrainian forces. Now, some of the soldiers that we've been talking to over uh, the last few days have told us that even though they are running low on their supplies, their determination to win this war remains as strong as ever. One soldier told us that even if we run out of weapons, we would pick stones up and use those against the Russians. They too said that uh, even though the Russians continue to try and uh, break through this front line, the Russians are also running out of people. Russia deaths are outnumbering uh, Ukrainian ones by a substantial ratio, but still, these Russian forces continue to come, and uh, over the last few months, we have seen uh, this Russian uh, front line make uh, very significant and uh, uh, very problematic advances through uh, these Ukrainian positions. Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, has been adamant that Ukraine needs more Western support if it is going to continue to fight this war against Russia. We know, too, though, from one soldier who told us just last night, in fact, that uh, even if uh, these uh, support comes even if uh, the support uh, from European countries and from the United States does end up manifesting itself on this front line. Uh, this is not a war that is going to end quickly. Indeed, he said this is a war that may not just take years, it may ultimately take decades. The question is whether Europe and the United States and the West are prepared to uh, defend and to back Ukraine for that amount of time. And if they are not, what that might ultimately mean for them. Earlier, I sat down with Russia's ambassador to the United Kingdom, Andrei Kellen. He says he's confident that Russia will prevail in its war with Ukraine. Ambassador Kellen, welcome to Roundtable again. Tell me, who is winning the war in Ukraine? Oh, obviously, this is Russia <laughs> that is uh, uh, going to win. Uh, I have no doubts about that. Uh, Probably uh, there is, uh, at the moment, uh, we do not have a very visible results. But I would like to attract your attention that Russia has much better adapted to the situation. Uh, the political and economical uh, system is stable. Uh, population uh, supports uh, what uh, President Putin is doing. Sanctions uh, do not bring uh, disaster uh, to Russia. They do not rupture the economy. And uh, the, we have a military industrial complex, which is now uh, works and we are self-sufficient in terms of, uh, uh, of continuing uh, what we are doing right now. In uh, contrast, uh, the Ukraine situation is very different. It is uh, ha hanging on a tiny rope. It depends a lot on external financement, and this dependency causes internal troubles, politically, internally, they have started. And, of course, uh, the anticipation that uh, this tiny rope of finance might be interrupted from time to time, it does not uh, motivate, uh, of course, uh, the armed forces uh, to uh, seriously 
uh, to seriously uh, go into struggle as it was in the beginning and a lot of consequences about that. So the answer is that it's a question of time right now. What does victory look like then from a Russian perspective? I do not know, but we need actually to uh, achieve our goals. Uh, this is demilitarization of Ukraine, denazification, which is also an important thing, uh, because any notion of, uh, kind of, uh, of existence of Nazi moods or uh, Nazi movements of parties, it should be eliminated from the Constitution. Ukraine should be neutral, and uh, all our interests, security interests, should be taken into account not only by Ukraine, but also by uh, European countries and especially the whole West. Uh, that includes the United States. Neutrality, as it has been stated in the Ukrainian constitution, plus the normal uh, uh, normal conditions for the Russian-speaking population are very important over there. Have you been surprised by the strength of the resilience shown by the Ukrainians? No, uh, this uh, strength of resilience is, has been paid uh, by the Western society, by the European Union and the United States. And we fully understand that uh, uh, the, the best profession right now in Ukraine. This is a soldier because he is paid very well and he has to fight for this. But in general, uh, I do not believe that uh, there is a very anti-Russian uh, mood over there since lots of uh, ties between Russia and Ukraine do exist. We have lots of relatives and uh, anti-Russian movement, anti-Russian ideas and all this concept, it does exist in certain uh, circles of Ukraine, mostly in the very west of Ukraine. Uh, and <coughs> they have been brought, uh, of course, to Kiev and to the center of Ukraine. <coughs> and it has become uh, the policy of the government by Zelensky, this extreme nationalism, which is uh, bordered uh, with Nazism, in fact. And this is very bad, I would say. We were told at the outset that this was a special military operation. That was the phrase that your president Putin right. used. Mm -hmm. We're two years in now. We were told this would last days, that Russia would walk to victory. Two years in and there's still no sign of this victory. It could have happened if uh, Ukraine uh, and especially uh, the uh, West will agree on conditions of the agreement that has been nearly reached in April 2022. We were very close to the agreement uh, and a lot of uh, um, positions has been reflected, uh, including neutrality, including uh, a delimitarization of the uh, m machine that Ukraine will not be threatening, not be a door, uh, breakthrough instrument uh, against Russia. It all has been agreed. Then uh, Boris Johnson, uh, the then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, has come uh, to Ukraine, has said no, no agreements with Russians, uh, uh, you have to go fighting. And it has been also reflected at uh, the communique that has been published by the Foreign Office after his visit. So, so Boris any, Johnson, any to be clear, Boris Johnson blocked peace efforts. He blocked peace efforts, of course, with a blessing from Washington because he cannot do it himself personally. But he has come over there. And uh, the uh, document that has been already initialed uh, by the head of the Ukrainian delegation, Arachmia, it has uh, been put into garbage and uh, Ukraine started to fight. So these are the consequences of uh, what has been done uh, by uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And uh, that's the way it goes. Now, situation has changed and we have to deal with the new situation. People are saying that Russia and Vladimir Putin look more confident in recent weeks and months. Is that a good assessment? I, I would say so, that is correct. It has been, by the way, a constatation of my interview to the Sky News yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we are more, uh, we understand what is happening. Uh, and we understand uh, probably the course of events in the coming months. Uh, contrary to that, I do believe that Ukrainian government do not understand what is happening. It is now in defense. Uh, it, they recognize it in defense, but what the sense of it? Because the further they are in defense, the more uh, the, uh, the defeat will be deeper and uh, more serious to them. Long term, does Russia want to occupy Ukraine or install a puppet government? I mean, what would be the dream scenario for Russia? I, uh, I uh, wouldn't speculate on that. Uh, that depends, it will be a situation as well. Because at a certain point in time, uh, the, those who are ruling now in Ukraine and those who are uh, in the West are uh, supplying arms uh, and money, they have to recognize 
facts that uh, Ukraine is going into the abyss. And not to allow totally to go Ukraine into the abyss, they have to st stop at a certain point, and then uh, we will have to discuss what will be the uh, end of the, the exit strategy. Well, let's meet our guests. In Kyiv is Yulia Osmolovska, a former diplomat in Ukraine's foreign affairs ministry. She's now the director of the Kyiv office of the GlobeSec think tank. In Northamptonshire, in England, is Keir Giles. He is senior consulting fellow of the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House. And here with me in the studio is Dr. Christian Nitsoyev. He's a senior lecturer at the Institute for Diplomacy and International Governance. That's at Loughborough University. You're all very welcome to Roundtable. Yulia, good to see you again. Just tell us how people are feeling in Ukraine as we're now two years into the war. Well, people are just uh, recalculating probably another term of uh, long fight and, and uh, resistance. So we haven't seen like uh, the quick uh, uh, finalization of, of the war, uh, especially when it comes to getting all the territories back. So uh, right now it's obvious and clear for most of people that it's going to take longer. So that means that uh, some kind of recalculation, as I mentioned, has been happening in minds of people now. I can't imagine how difficult the past two years have been for the people of Ukraine. The one thing that really sticks out for me, I spoke to the Russian ambassador just there, as we've seen in the program, he's based in London. The Russians do seem to be increasingly aggressive and more confident. Would you say that's a good assessment? Definitely, yes. Um, and uh, however, they say that uh, they would like to negotiate. Uh, uh, all of us know perfectly well that uh, they're not going to do it because uh, they're really counting on time. They're really counting on a lot of uh, turbulence, uh, political turbulence in Europe and in the United States. And they see it uh, as their benefit. Uh, meanwhile, they are uh, gearing up uh, the military industrial complex uh, to strengthen them and to, to treat in Europe again. So it's, uh, it's quite uh, uh, evident. Kira, is that a good assessment again from Yulia there, that all of this turbulence we're seeing in various different countries is playing into Putin's hands? That's absolutely right. There are direct impacts already. Everybody was thinking about uh, the possible arrival back in power of President Trump in the United States as D-Day when, uh, when the situation gets very much worse for global security. But for some ways in Ukraine, we're already there because a combination of timidity by the current administration and the political hostage taking that's been taking place both in Washington and in Brussels, interrupting those flayed, flows of aid that's both uh, humanitarian and economic and direct military aid to Ukraine has substantially changed the, the this situation on the front line. We hear time and again right across that immensely extended front line from first-hand experience of what it means to be starved of munitions to actually hold off Russian attacks. So yes, all of the political upheavals that we're seeing, these political nervous breakdowns on both sides of the Atlantic are having a direct impact and it could potentially get very much worse. Kier, can you believe we're two years into this and there's no end in sight for the people of Ukraine? Well, it was a little strange to hear you say just a moment about Russia feeling more confident and aggressive because, after all, they launched this because they were confident and aggressive. They were confident that they could walk into Kiev and there would not be a substantial strong reaction from Ukraine's Western backers. And, of course, it takes a basic level of aggression to actually want to launch a war of colonial reconquest and, and commit genocide in the course of it. But I would say, rather, Russia has been emboldened by what it sees going on around the world and the impacts that it's actually having on Ukraine. And Yulia is absolutely right. They're in a position where they can sit and wait for things to get worse. Christian, that is a very good phrase that we've just heard there from Kier, a war of colonial reconquest. That's what this is all about, isn't it? I think to some extent Kier is right. Uh, imperialism is at the backbone of the Russian state. It's ingrained in the Russian state institutions and probably it will need a really important paradigm shift to change the importance of uh, imperialism and colonialism on the Russian side. But on the other hand, I'm not sure that Russia really has the resources to go through and implement a colonial or an imperial policy, even in Ukraine. I mean, uh, 
we've discussed here about the fact that uh, the United States and the European Union is wavering in terms of funding, and this had some impact on the situation on the battlefield. But at the same time, it's taken Russia two years to get Adivka, and it's been a battleground for I would say, more than 10 years at this point. So that, to some extent, I think questions whether or not Russia really has the ability to implement a larger imperial project and go to the Baltic states, for, for example, or f to Eastern Europe. But uh, a lot of analysts would actually argue that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was an irrational aspect. So the fact that it doesn't really have the capabilities to implement an imperialistic policy, that doesn't mean it won't try to do it. A town you mentioned, Ardivka, Yes. I read 37,000 fatalities and wounded Russians for that one town, and it has taken them months and months to get it. I mean, how long can they keep going like this? Well, for the Russian state, Adivka has been quite strategic, even though we hear quite a lot in the mainstream media that Adivka is merely symbolic. But I think the Russians have been trying to get hold of the town for, for many years, and it's been heavily fortified by the Ukrainian army. So I, I guess from the perspective of President Putin or from the perspective of the Kremlin, it's an important victory. And you can see that from the way in which uh, Putin emphasized in one of his latest speeches the importance of uh, Adivka. But at the same time, I mean, to, to go back to your question, I think the way in which Russia has proceeded with mobilizing forces in the country has not really impacted the middle class and other people who generally, if, if they would be discontent against the government, that would really raise a lot of eyebrows and that would probably push the government to change course. So at this point, I, I think there still probably is a rather, I wouldn't say endless, but there still is a big supply of, uh, it's not a nice word, cannon fodder, but that's, that's what actually is happening on the ground. So we, we shouldn't sugarcoat it. Yulia, what would you say to any European or world leaders who are tiring of supporting Ukraine. I mean, there's a lot of concern about Donald Trump getting into the White House, Viktor Orban in Hungary, people looking at their domestic budgets and saying, why should we support Ukraine? Just spell out for us how desperately your country is in need of ammunition and military help. I wouldn't put it probably in emotional mode, like uh, telling how desperate Ukraine is uh, in need for, for these weapons. I'm just uh, wondering why our European partners, or probably part of European partners, are not understanding that it is imminent threat to them. It's not just for Ukraine. I can compare this with our feeling when Russia invaded part of Georgia. So we also had been very sympathetic to Georgians, but we actually never realized the threat in its uh, uh, real substance until we received the same. So I think uh, that once they see fighter, Russian fighter jets flying over there um, uh, in, in their skies or Russian missiles with very horrible sounds flying over their houses, I think the perception of threat will change, but it will be too late. So basically, my message is uh, that uh, you shouldn't wait for this testing moment to actually test your uh, uh, readiness to, um, uh, to, of resilience of your country to fight the enemy. Because uh, the recent statistics that we've seen about different replies in, in different countries, UK included actually, not so many people are ready to fight in the conventional fight against Russia. So it's better probably to stop them back in Ukraine rather than actually experiment with existential threats um, on their own front doors. Kier, do you think more people in Europe need to start looking ahead to Putin's perhaps even further expansionist aims, looking at the Baltic states, for example? You know, if he succeeds in Ukraine, he won't stop there, will he? No, that's exactly right. And just to, to build on Yulia's point, one of the key messages that hasn't got across to European populations west of Warsaw is that this war is not about Ukraine. As far as Putin is concerned, this is the war on the West. And that's the reason why the frontline states, those that are neighboring Russia, are the ones that have been the most enthusiastic and generous in supporting Ukraine because they know that if Russia is stopped in Ukraine, they won't be next. But that's not a consciousness that has actually permeated much into Western Europe 
that still thinks it's insulated from the threat by distance. And that's why we don't see the urgency among those governments in France, in the UK, in Germany, for reconstituting their defenses in order to be ready for what comes when Russia thinks Ukraine has been resolved for it to its satisfaction. And the fear now that is widespread among people who are watching defense postures, watching Russia, is that if we start now, it may well be too late. I want to take a look at where Ukraine is getting most of its aid from. This data, which you're seeing on screen now, is compiled by Germany's Kiel Institute. It shows that EU institutions have topped the list since Russia attacked in January 2022 with over 85 billion euros worth of help. Most of that has come in the form of financial assistance. The US is the next biggest donor with nearly 68 billion euros. The military component of that is by far the biggest of any of Ukraine's allies. Germany comes third overall, and the UK is fourth. I mean, Christian, a lot of countries need to step up now and really get on board and support Ukraine. Well, I think we should also focus on the non-military support as well, because there have been problems, for example, with agricultural workers in Poland or in Hungary or in Romania who've opposed helping Ukraine. And I think the military aspect is just one component but Ukraine's economy needs to be helped from a different perspective as well. But if we look at uh, the figures you've just outlined, I, the situation in the United States is quite perplexing because if we were to have this discussion a year ago, I think everyone would have supported giving more aid, military aid or financial aid to Ukraine. But now it seems that, I would say very cynically, that a large part of the establishment in the United States doesn't care that much about Ukraine, but cares more about the fight with Russia. And at the end of the day, in, we live in the age of social media, everyone has uh, not a very long attention span, I would say. So it seems that uh, a, a lot of the public attention in the United States is moving from the situation in Ukraine. You also have the conflict in, in Gaza at the same time. I saw yesterday an opinion poll that was delivered by the Quincy Institute, which is obviously an, a Republican-leaning institute, but it argued that 70% of Americans would like to see talks uh, being opened between Russia and Ukraine. So this, the situation, I think, in the United States is quite perplexing. And I'm personally disappointed that uh, the way in which, particularly the Republicans, but also the Democrats, have managed uh, to, uh, let's say, dent the public support towards, towards Ukraine. Yulia, give us an indication of your daily life, your routine, how you've managed to keep going not knowing every day whether there will be a Russian artillery shell hitting your building or where you work. Just paint for us a picture of daily life in Kyiv. Well, um, daily life in Kyiv, uh, you probably know from uh, all this um, uh, uh, studies on trauma that uh, uh, different kind of uh, traumatic experience provides with the post-traumatic growth phase when you uh, reassess your life with different values. So basically, these days, I think uh, the whole Ukrainian, uh, all Ukrainians are very much valuing um, uh, un uh, uninterrupted nights. For instance, when you have this chance to, to sleep for the whole night without being disturbed by air alerts, because in cases there are missiles, you go to shelters and you just count all these missiles, because me personally, I can hear them flying over my house. And uh, you just prepare every minute to die because you don't know where they will be actually <laughs> targeting. And even if they shot down, so the remnants uh, at the breeze, they are quite dangerous as well. You've seen a lot of reports on that. So people just got used to it. It's a new normality, I might say. Uh, and we have become a bit selective when we understand, for instance, that it just um, uh, the uh, airborne of a fighter jet that's just one fighter jet somewhere in the air, so no indications of missiles being set. So we we understand that we still can have some more hours to do some something. Uh, but if there is an air alert about missiles or drone, kamikaze drone attacks, so definitely it's more dangerous situation. So people go to Sherta. So I think, um, especially in compared to the previous winter, for instance, you probably noticed that this winter we didn't have a lot of attacks on critical infrastructure, and uh, part of our military experts say that this is indirect indication that Russians also
also running out of ammunition and they're not very much, uh, they have to be very savvy actually to consider them targeting particular military sites and not just pouring them down on critical infrastructure in Ukraine. So this uh, uh, winter we spent almost uninterrupted when it comes to civilian civilian infrastructure partially, but you've seen all this report on, on casualties and they're quite devastating. Kira, I'll just come back to you on that point. I mean, it is shocking what Yulia and the whole of Ukraine have been through. And it's the failure of imagination by other people in Europe not realizing that this could happen to them if it is not stopped in Ukraine. Now, at the moment in Tallinn, in the capital of Estonia, there is a billboard campaign to raise awareness among people of what the threat is. It's superimposing on street scenes, the same scenes but devastated after, you might think, a Russian attack. So apartment buildings that are falling down, uh, the aftermath of missile attacks, craters and so on. The problem is... The frontline states like Estonia are not the ones that actually need to be reminded of what the threat is and what the problem is and what it means to be living under these Russian attacks that are indiscriminate and carry out casual murder of civilians, men, women and children every day. It's the countries behind it. It's the United States, it's, which sadly I don't feel myself as perplexed as Christian was saying as to what is happening in the United States. It is political hostage taking for very narrow domestic motives and either remaining indifferent to or ignorant of the fact that what happens in Ukraine and in Europe is actually critically important for the prosperity and security of Americans too, because they are dependent on a global system that Russia is challenging. Here, Yulia and my colleague Christian here, thank you all so much for your insight. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.